My name is Zanara Grana. I'm a senior tech analyst with Bloomberg Intelligence. Uh, Bloomberg Intelligence is Bloomberg's in-house research arm. Uh, prior to Bloomberg, I was a sell-side analyst recommending stocks to, uh, to investors. At Bloomberg, uh, you know, my role is to write about major technology companies on our platform. People read about it. We do not uh, recommend companies. But, you know, you get a good idea of how we think uh, companies are positioned. And my, at my, uh, with my role, I cover large-cap software and IT services companies. So that would include IBM, Microsoft, Oracle, SAP, uh, Cognizant, and a you know, bunch of others uh, uh, across the world, including Capgemini. So one of the things I've been uh, wanted to start off with, actually, is the IBM Red Hat uh, deal. Um, that's been on our minds for the last, uh, I would say, 36 hours or so, ever since Sunday afternoon. And uh, I have received a lot of questions in, uh, about this, uh, did a bunch of uh, discussions with investors and, uh, um, you know, folks like yourself said yesterday about it. But, you know, we think finally it gives IBM something decent to sell in our view. I mean, this is, IBM's had a, had a very, uh, I would say, a rough six, seven years because um, the pace at which enterprises started to shift things to the cloud, move to more modern things, curtail IT outsourcing in general, um, shut down data center outsourcing, desktop work, it really had a massive impact on their business. Now, they did invest aggressively in some of the other areas, but you know the leak in the boat was, was way too big to um, not be complemented by other things that were growing. And their software assets weren't that good as well, given they were you know, part of a vertical stack, a lot of the things they sell. Uh, the little growth that they have seen over the past, uh, uh, I would say, year or so is from the mainframe refresh cycle, which I think is, a, is actually very interesting because it starts to use a lot of machine learning, something which we'll be talking first over here. Um, uh, but, it's, but, but, but with the Red Hat, I think that gives an opportunity for them to really improve their software stack but I feel the real benefit is going to be in the services arm. Because if you look for a company like Accenture or Deloitte or even Capgemini today, their constant currency growth rate has accelerated over the past three years or so. And a lot of that is driven by modernization of the cloud. And as uh, you know, we have written in the past extensively about it, that bulk of the IT spending is still on-premise. I mean, it's not in the cloud. If you look at global tech spending, it's somewhere around a trillion and a half in that range. Um, cloud spending is only about 150, 200 billion. The bulk of the spending is still done by a lot of you in-house, and that's where you know people should be focusing in. And uh, you know, if you look at somebody like a Microsoft, who has a very strong on-premise presence, very strong cloud presence, uh, companies like Red Hat, VMware are now facilitating their on-premise cloud to move some of the workloads to the public cloud or in whichever form their clients want. So being cloud agnostic, I think, is going to be the single biggest issue IBM will face in our view. If they are truly cloud agnostic, I think this can really help both their services business, helping people modernize, move things to cloud as and when needed. Um, but if they are not, and they still go back to the old habits of trying to sell everything down their own stack, try to force customer to adopt IBM's cloud, um, you know, Watson only ran on IBM Cloud for a while. I think that was such a mistake in our view. Uh, we have called out, you know, called them out on that as well, that they should have let Watson run on AWS, Google, Azure. It would have really helped evangelize that concept a lot better. So if, in our view, if IBM sticks to the culture of Red Hat of being truly cloud agnostic, it would help them. If they go out in the old habits, I think it's going to punish them. So that's two cents that we wanted to talk about uh, IBM this acquisition of Red Hat. So as far as the artificial intelligence and machine learning capabilities today, you know, we've started to see a lot more applications of this in almost every vertical. It's still very tiny portion of actual funding and work being done compared to the hype. Um, not as much as blockchain, I would say, but still, you know, there's, there is still money that's being made today. Um, the number one application that we think we can, you know, we're going to start to see the extensive use of machine learning is going to be in the securities business, in the security software business. Um, truly, uh, one of the examples that we talk about over here is, um, you know, Oracle just launched a database called the Autonomous Database. They did a lot of, um, you know, marketing around it, hype around it, but in our view, the concept is what I want to take from here. Um, you know, we think that every software asset going forward should have a lot of machine learning built into it. 
especially when it comes to uh, patch updating and, and, and provisioning. Uh, because, you know, if you remember the Equifax um, uh, breach uh, from just a couple of years ago or so, that was all done, or was all possible because some Apache struts were not uh, patched at the proper time. And if you, even if you read secu you know, se uh, security reports, either from Cisco or Verizon or some of the other companies, patching still has like, you know, your new, new security patch comes out, it takes six to nine months at an average for that to be installed onto your software assets. And I mean, think about it, you don't even, you know, in your consumer phone, you know, you, I, I'm assuming people are updating their iOS or Android pretty frequently, but you don't see that on the enterprise. And that really is one of the single biggest reasons why people can get into your network. So something like that of self-patching as soon as the patch comes out across all your software asset uh, using machine learning, I think, is one of the single most important uh, factors that would help pre prevent cyber uh, attacks. The other thing that we are seeing is um, advanced malware. So what typically would happen is you have malwares uh, of the, the, the previous era, which were basically signature-based. I would know this particular virus or this particular tr you know, um, trait of virus has these characteristics, and my security software system would actually store that in the database. Every time the traffic would come through, it would look at it, and if it's not there, it would let the traffic pass. But if you're a software developer, you can, in a very simple way, change slight code of that malware, and suddenly you have a new malware with kind of almost everything alike, and that the system would let it pass. That should not happen, but it's very difficult mathematically for somebody to do it, um, some, a, a human to do it. Using machine learning, we, you know, we are very confident something like this can be prevented, at least um, to try out something that you know, we have already known in the past and have had fair amount of correlation or resemblance to that particular one. So those two things we think as very, you know, I, I think in, you know, it's not as um, glamorous, but we think it has one of the biggest use cases for the entire software industry in terms of use cases. Um, the other thing that we talk a lot about is image recognition. That's, that's actually become very uh, impressive over the last 12 months. Uh, Google and, and Watson both have done a lot of work on it. Google uh, certainly, um, and, and you know, that is uh, one of the very important steps for us towards autonomous driving. Uh, I would actually recommend um, those of you who do not use Google Photos on your phone to try it one day. I mean, I, I was blown away just recently um, I have about 5,000, 6,000 pictures, and if you were to write down just a, you know, a boat or a hat or beer, or I mean, the recognition has become pretty impressive. Um, I was at a panel three, four years ago, and I was sitting next to somebody at Google, and um, I was asking her, they said, listen, I have a very big problem. I have um, you know, two kids and thousands of pictures. How do I tag them properly? Because I'm I like to be pretty organized, and, and it's not possible. She says, you don't have to. You just write it in the search box. I said, what are you talking? And today, if I can write down, you know, Halloween of my daughter at, you know, for, at age three, it would actually pick up that picture, and it's, it's getting pretty good. So let's look at the commercial aspect of it. Um, IBM's doing a lot of work on it, and, and so is Google, but MRIs. Healthcare industry will, will, will see this massive benefit from that, and IBM's already starting to use that, is... If I go get an MRI done, and you typically would have hundreds and thousands of pictures taken for that particular MRI, and then a technician would have to go sift through a lot of them to see, find any abnormality. Um, through AI or machine learning, you can actually run those set of pictures to millions of other pictures that are in a database, and you could compare and detect any abnormality which then a physician would go and see. So a physician now would see only a handful of 10 or 20 pictures rather than going through, you know, let's say, a, a set of hundreds of them, and the error rate actually improves quite a bit on that. Uh, same thing with natural language processing. This is where Watson really started back in those Jeopardy days, and you can see where we are today. Um, this is something we you know, got from Google. Um, you know, we are very very uh, close to how humans, uh, you know, accuracy of humans. So now, um, again, there's a lot of um, application of it, both in the medical industry. So you're going through, you know, uh, Sloan Kettering right here uh, uses a lot of the Watson-related. So if you give your symptoms of all the different, uh, you know, disease that you have or, or the, the supposedly what kind of cancer could it be, 
Then that system goes through millions of records of uh, textbooks, old patient records, um, and any other uh, material it could find, and come, comes back with the confidence interval that, okay, with a 95% confidence, uh, I could say this is what you have. And that level of treatment is actually going to uh, help you know, early and more accurate detection of cancer, which is becoming, you know, which has, I think, 20, 25%, uh, there's an error rate over there in the previous time. So that, that is going to truly change the way we do uh, things on the healthcare side. On the oil and, gas, uh, oil and gas side, you could go through millions of old manuals if some part breaks down and it would start giving you results. So that's a lot of the use case of natural language processing. I cover a very interesting company out of Canada called Shopify. If you haven't looked at it, please take a you know take a take a peek at it. It also just became the uh, the de facto uh, software provider for cannabis sales in uh, uh, Canada. Um, these guys provide software to um, startups. If you want to you know open a store tomorrow, you can go online and within a few hours you can have your own online store. Um, and they have they run a lot of interesting uh, businesses. So if you are a small business and you want some cash advanced because you have orders and then you got to go build something, you can use, um, uh, and, and, and for Shopify, they're using only machine learning to start giving these loans. There's not one human involved in it. I mean, there are, they have loans up to $300, $400 million somewhere in that range at this point to their uh, customers or the users of their software, and they don't have one credit officer sitting there. And that's all using machine learning. So think about it, how much data that they're ingesting, seeing the orders, seeing what kind of credibility this person has based on order history, and making those decisions on the fly. Um, voice assistance. Now, this is where we think things are becoming very interesting, especially in the customer care industry. Um, I have been able to uh, do a lot of things just with chatbots now. I mean, I think just about a year, year and a half ago, things were not very good, but I've been able to do a lot of transactions just with that. Um, in the customer care industry, using AI and automation, um, we are now reducing uh, call volume or calls going to humans by 60 70%. If you haven't looked at this industry, you should see there was a recent, you know, there's a, there's a wave of consolidation happening there. Um, we think this is going to be the first place where you're going to see massive um, cut down of humans being involved in trying to get some customer care done, whether it is, um, you know, IT help desks or just your normal customer care when you call somewhere. Um, and the margins of that industry, we think, are going to go up dramatically because of that. Um, lastly, facial recognition. This is a very controversial topic. I'm not going to get into any of the immigration aspect that we read recently where, what Amazon's doing. But the biggest thing, what, we, what I can say over here is go to the Amazon store over there at the Columbus Circle. It uses a lot of those features to see what you're picking up and shopping out. It takes almost no time in doing that. So that's all from us. Uh, thanks so much uh, for today.